Good evening. Welcome to the 2023 UGA Three Minute Thesis Competition. My name is Meredith Welch Devine. I'm the Assistant Dean of the Graduate School, and I am so pleased to be here with you guys tonight. This is the first time we've done this in person since 2019, and it is just so lovely to be here with you. Uh, we are also streaming it live so that friends and family from around the, around the world can join us as well. So we're super pleased to do this. As you probably know, graduate students are the engines of innovation. They're the drivers of our creativity. Our graduate students are also really, really brave. There were 71 entrants in this year's 3MT competition. So it was no easy feat to get down to the 10 that you're gonna see tonight. And all of our finalists should be extremely proud to be here because this was not easy. So let's give them all a round of applause. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies for the evening, James Hathaway, who is the Assistant Director of Media Relations here at UGA. James? It's a thunderous applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, like so many annual live events, uh, we had to suspend in-person competitions during the pandemic, and this is the first one we're having back in person again, so it's really wonderful to see everybody here, to see a fresh new group of competitors. I know uh, you're going to enjoy hearing from them. I've had the pleasure of being a part of this program for a number of years now, and every year I'm blown away by how brilliant our students are and the fantastic work that they're doing. So I know you'll look forward to hearing about it. But I want to give you a little bit of an overview of kind of how the evening is going to go, how our competitors are going to be evaluated. The competition actually began in Australia, in Queens, the University of Queensland. Uh, so it started as a sort of simple idea that you take research, you give someone a limited amount of time and a limited amount of flashy stuff to put behind them and have them explain their research, why it's important, why we should care, why we should pay attention. And obviously three minutes is a relatively short period of time. Your average TED talk can go on for a half hour or maybe even more. You have only three minutes to do this. So you really have to try to condense all this complex work down into a very tight package. And it's, it's tricky to do. So uh, our competitors tonight and this is sort of a, an evolution of the rules that were originally established in Queensland. It's really very simple, despite everything you see here. Uh, you have three minutes, and only three minutes. There is someone right up here in the front with a timer so our competitors can see how they're doing and whether or not the clock is ticking down. If uh, the clock goes all the way, they, they, they have to stop their presentation. But uh, you have three minutes to do it. You can have one slide up here. The slide has to be static. It can't move, it can't, uh, there can't be any animations. I know I love using them in my PowerPoint presentations, explosions and things like that, but you can't do that here. Uh, you also really can only speak. So you, you can't play a musical instrument, you can't do an interpretive dance. It's just you, your voice, this one static slide, and the audience. So it, like I said, it is tricky, but uh, I think you'll see that our uh, students here at UGA are more than capable of handling the challenge. So the decision of our judges is final, obviously, um, and this is the criteria. Again, this is uh, a lot of information, but it's fairly simple. You have compre comprehension and content. This is how clearly things were articulated. Did you understand what they were saying? Did they get across this fundamental message of what their research is, why it's important, that sort of thing? Second section, though, is engagement and communication. This is the part that I like to just call, did you enjoy hearing it? So did you understand it and did you enjoy it? So it, did you uh, understand their PowerPoint slide? Were, did they use uh, terminology that you could understand, but also were they engaging? Did they have a stage presence? Did you want to hear more from them, even though you were only given that brief three minutes of a presentation? So this really is a part, uh, uh, an exercise in communication and communication effective, to uh, communicate effectively, you have to be enthusiastic, you have to make people care, you have to make them, or at least pretend like you care. Uh, so you, you know, that, that's part of, the, part of the thing here. But let's get to the really important stuff, prizes. The grand prize winner will receive $1,000. That's right. 
A runner-up will receive $750, and the People's Choice Award, I'll, I'll say more about that here in just a moment, will receive $500 like to introduce our judges for the uh, evening. They've been very kind to uh, give us their time and evaluate our competitors this evening. Uh, if you wouldn't mind standing up just briefly while we, uh, while we recognize you, uh, Stuart Rayfield is the Vice Chancellor, Leadership and Institutional Development, the University System of Georgia. <laughs> Laura Smothers, Founder and Director of the Joy Village School. And Neil Quirk is the chair of the University of Georgia Foundation Board of Trustees and partner at Quirk and Quirk. Thank you all very much for your time tonight. We appreciate it a lot. So uh, please silence your cell phones. Please keep your arms and legs inside the ride throughout the duration. If you do have to get up, please do wait uh, in between competitors. So there will be a little bit of a pause. We have people who have to put on microphones for our live stream, for our recording. So there'll be a little bit of time in between uh, each competitor. Don't worry, I'm going to fill that time with my attempt at humor, uh, which tonight will come in the form of trivia that I've discovered on the world's most reliable source the internet. So uh, People's Choice Awards, I will remind you about this again towards the end of the competition, but each one of you should have a program for this evening. And on the back of that program, you should see a QR code. If you scan that QR code with your phone, that's what will take you to the poll for People's Choice where you can vote for your favorite competitor. But I would obviously encourage you to wait until the very end because your favorite competitor might be the very last one. So uh, sit back and relax and we will get started. So our first presenter this evening is Chisholm McCauley. Her talk is titled Equity and Wellness Development of an e-learning training to improve healthy beverage consumption in black families of young children. Chisholm. Hello. Do you know that a 16 fluid ounce of your regular soda contains about 14 teaspoons of added sugar? This quantity is higher than the recommendation by the Dietary Guidelines of America for the amount of added sugar we should consume daily. No wonder sugar-sweetened beverages or sugary drinks are the primary source of added sugar in the American diet, and even for young children between the ages of zero to five. When kids consume these drinks, they have the increased risk to develop diabetes, dental cavities, overweight, obesity, or even heart condition. By race, black children are the highest consumers of sugary drinks and the lowest consumers of healthy drinks like clean water compared to their peers. Now you can see that there is a disparity gap and there is need for health equity promotion. Parents are the primary sources of those drinks to their children and is influenced by targeted marketing and even the knowledge of beverages. As a parent myself, I have two children under the ages of three and I'm passionate about raising healthy kids. And that is why I decided to develop a resource in form of developing an e-learning training to help black parents learn about beverages so that they can make informed healthy choices for their kids who through observing their parents and seeing what their parents are doing can take up these behaviors into adulthood and live a healthier life. So you would ask why e-learning? I chose e-learning to offset barriers to in-person learning, like childcare. I had to look for someone to stay with my children to come here, transportation, and even the emergence of COVID-19. So in order for me to develop an effective e-learning training, I went to the whole of Georgia. I was pregnant then, and interesting. And I recruited parents, black parents, who were 18 years and above and had children between the ages of zero to five to complete a survey through Qualtrics so that I could learn about their preferred e-learning format and if they're interested in participating in my training. I also conducted individual interviews for me to learn about the expectations. What do they want to see in the training? I'm sure you'll be wondering, what about results? So for the results, I had 64 black parents participate in my survey. This included both male and female, and more than 40% of them are interested in broadcasting, or what you call video-based learning. More than 60% are willing to participate in my training, meaning that I'm not wasting my time. And when it comes to expectation, they said they wanted to see people that look like them, representation matters. They want to learn about healthy recipes. They want to learn about the consequences of drinking sugary drinks. And they wanted videos that are very short, not longer than five minutes. 
So what I'm currently doing now is that I'm working with a graphic designer Why I am the script writer and we are developing seven mini videos that are no longer than five minutes that are culturally appropriate, sensitive to be a useful resource for black families, thereby promoting health equity. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Chisholm. Uh, this is the part of the evening, ladies and gentlemen, that I was talking about, where we have a little bit of a period of, well, we have to let the judges tabulate their scores, write down some comments, and so I get to fill that void. Um, I think you'll find that all the information I have here tonight will be useless. Um, it is, will take up space in your brain if you remember anything I say, and later you may find yourself cursing me for telling you some of this. Um, my first favorite statistic, and again, I, I did look some of these up, and I tried a little bit to verify that they were true. Humans spend an average of about 13% of their lives not focusing on anything in particular, just hanging out. You can't hum if you hold your nose. Oh, I love that. About half of you just reached right for your nose to give it a try. Go on. Everybody can give it a try. You cannot hum if you hold your nose. Right? Yeah. See, you learned something about yourself this evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're welcome. Uh, also, uh, polar bears are invisible on night vision goggles. That, that's not practical at all. That's not useful. I don't imagine any of you will run into this a situation where you need to look for a polar bear with night vision. But in case you do, it doesn't work. We, you, you need to get into this, because I got like six more pages of this stuff. <laughs> um, also, I should say, part of this process for me involves incredibly awkward segues to the next competitor. So, are you ready for one of those? All right, perfect. Thanks, Mom. Uh, our next competitor is Karen Gonzalez. The title of her presentation is Humans versus Viruses. Karen. I still remember that day when I was about 12 years old and I got home with a really bad cough. I was coughing the whole day. And the only thing that my family told me was, ah, don't worry about it. It's just a simple cold. You are going to be fine tomorrow. Maybe you have heard something like this before too. I grew up believing in this idea that colds were something not to worry about. However, just three years ago, we all witnessed how a simple cold was able to kill more than one million people here in the United States, and it put all the world down on its knees. The number of Americans killed by the COVID-19 pandemic is about 10 times the number of Americans who died during the World War I, and it's more than two times the number of Americans who died during the World War II. Yes, these numbers are devastating. And the bad news is that coronavirus is not the only virus that can produce such fatalities. There are many respiratory diseases like influenza or the flu that kill thousands of people every year. Now, the question is how we can protect ourselves against these biological threats. To me, the answer is clear, vaccines. When people started to get vaccinated against COVID-19, the number of fatal cases dropped by 90%. This means that about 30,000 Americans were saved every week. What an amazing accomplishment. However, we are not completely safe yet. Viruses also want to survive, and to avoid being recognized by our immune system and to be able to attack again, they disguise themselves by making small changes on their external structures. Just like spies when they change their hairstyle or they wear sunglasses to conceal among people. Viral disguise, new vaccine, viral disguise, new vaccine. This is the never-ending cycle that characterizes the human versus virus battle. With my research, I want to break this cycle once and for all. I work with four different respiratory viruses, and my goal is to create vaccines that can protect us even when these viruses try to disguise themselves. To achieve this, I take the external structures of different versions of the same virus and I combine that into one single molecule. This molecule will summarize all the identities of that virus and will help our body to create defenses against all of them. 
these so-called universal vaccines are our best hope to make the simple calls something simple for real. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, boy, speaking of COVID-19, that was a really unfortunate time. I, uh, I grew a beard during the pandemic. Uh, it's, I still have it. Uh, what, should, you think I should keep the beard? I was gonna keep it regardless of what you said. Um, but I think it was mostly because I wore a mask so much I just didn't have the opportunity to shave. So I just woke up one morning and took the mask off. I was like, oh my God, I can grow a beard. This is fantastic. Um, so that was really one of the few nice things that came out of the pandemic for me is that I have to shave less now. Um, let's see, we were talking about polar bears, night vision. This was an interesting one. So this was an older poll, uh, but I think it was, uh, it was interesting. A survey of 7,000 people across six countries, this is about 20 years ago or so, found that more people recognized McDonald's golden arches than they did the Christian cross. All right, not everybody worships at the altar of McDonald's, I get that. The average plastic bag gets used for 12 minutes, but it takes up to 1,000 years to biodegrade. I'm sorry, I've depressed everyone, that's my bad. Queen Cleopatra lived closer in time to the launch of the iPhone than to the building of the Great Pyramid. When the Great Pyramids were built, woolly mammoths still roamed the earth. No? Yeah, I like that one, whatever. Now for another one of my awkward segues. Here we go. Our next speaker this evening is Qian Feng, and her talk is titled, More Than a Water Bomb, Bring Aroma Back Into Tomato. Qian. I want to start my talk with a quote that I really like. Knowledge is knowing tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. I think a lot of you can relate to this as well because we all know the tomatoes we buy nowadays are often just like big but tasteless water bombs. There is a strong market demand of fresh tomato with great flavor. And to fulfill this demand, we first need to understand what flavor is. The first thing that comes into your mind may be how sweet or sour the fruit tastes. However, there's more to that. In fact, how the fruit smells can also significantly affect, affect our perception of the overall flavor. The aroma of tomato fruit comes from a group of chemicals called volatiles. Despite the importance of volatiles in tomato flavor, not a lot of research has been done on this topic. I consider my PhD project a fun road trip to bring aroma back into tomato. Well, to make the road trip, I will need to know the roads and also have maps. In this case, the roads are the biochemical pathways. Because we want to know exactly at which step it goes wrong. My work more specifically is to identify the key factors in those pathways. What genes are used to synthesize the volatiles? What regulators are used to switch the process on and off? To answer those questions, I make genetic maps to guide me. These genetic maps are specific regions in the tomato genome that affect volatile variation. And I compare the DNA composition of tomato with different volatile levels and determine the specific genetic locations that uh, are associated with the volatile production. With the genetic maps, I will be able to look for the causal genes based on their biochemical functions. The next step is to utilize the genes to, in the actual breeding process. The plant breeders can use the maps I construct as well as the mapped genes in the breeding cycle to create the ideal volatile profile in the new tomato cultivars. The outcome of my research will also include a set of genetic markers to fasten the breeding cycle, similar to having a database that 23andMe uses. I'm excited to see more flavored tomato back to our dining table, and I hope you are too. Thank you.
Thank you very much, John. Now, where were we? Plastic bags, Queen Cleopatra, right, 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 yeah. Oh, I love this. This I read in a newspaper, so it has to be true. A tombstone with the inscription, you will always be remembered, never forgotten, currently resides in the lost and found apartment at Dublin Airport in Ireland. In 1567, the man with the world's longest ever beard broke his neck and died after tripping over it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll shave the beard off after all. The guillotine, everybody remembers the guillotine from, from history class, right? Really wasn't that long ago the last time it was used. Sep September 10th, 1977. That was the last time someone was executed with a guillotine, which is about four months after the release of the first Star Wars movie. Those two events aren't related in any way. It's just a handy way to mark. Never mind. Nintendo. How many of you have heard of Nintendo? How many of you play video games created by Nintendo? How many of you would guess that Nintendo actually dates back to about 1889? Yeah. So Nintendo started as a... Uh, they, they created something called Hanafuda, which in Japanese literally means uh, flower cards, but it's a card game. Um, so they, they, they made that for years and years and years. And then the 1960s, they basically turned into a toy company, but it wasn't until 1981 that they turned into the Nintendo that we all know and love, the creators of Mario, The Legend of Zelda, Pokemon, all those things, with their debut hit, Donkey Kong. There you go. See, I told you some of this stuff is useful-ish. And now another awkward segue to our next competitor, Yang Su. Yang Su's presentation is called The Bacteria Glycan, A Sweet Trojan Horse in Disguise. Yang, please. Hi. In the Greek mythology, the Odysseus army constructed a giant hollow wooden horse and gave it to the city of Troy uh, with, with a group of Greek soldiers hidden inside. The Trojan people did not realize the danger under the cover of wood and accepted the gift. However, at that night, the Greek soldiers emerged and quickly took over the city of Troy. This is the story of Trojan Horse. It's a myth, but the actual tactic of Trojan Horse is being employed in a war between bacteria and humans every day, every second. I study a group of bacteria called Bodotella. They are the cause of whooping cough in humans leading to tens of millions of people getting sick and hundreds of thousands of children dying every year. And therefore, they are considered the bad bacteria. When we came across those bad bacteria, our immune system will be activated and rat security alarm will be raised so that they will be destroyed. However, those bad bacteria are clever. Oftentimes, they will cover themselves in disguise to avoid being recognized. More specifically, they will cover themselves with a glaze of sugar coat so that they can no longer be recognized. When they cover themselves with a sugar coat, we can no longer recognize them as harmful intruders. They get a green light, pass the security guard of our immune system, take over the body, and eventually lead to the disease. My research is focused on those Trojan horse glycans. I want to understand what those Trojan horse glycans are made of why our immune system cannot recognize them, and most importantly, how we can destroy them. To destroy those Trojan horse glycan, I'm currently developing a vaccine. This vaccine contains the Trojan horse glycan linked with a label. This label, showed here as a skull symbol, tells our immune system that the Trojan horse glycan is dangerous and needs to be destroyed. This vaccine will help us to better recognize any coming Trojan horse disguised bacteria so that we can destroy them immediately. By transforming the lesson we learned from the Greek mythology to medical reality, I hope I can protect more people from this deadly infection disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yang. 
You know, I, I can't help but feel a little silly reading these things off. I look at some of the work that our students are doing. They're curing diseases. They're studying fantastic works of literature, probing the depths of history. And I come out here and I'm just like, you can't see polar bears with night vision goggles. It's, I, I, I take it a little personally, but that's okay. That's, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work my way through it. Uh, there are a lot of really wonderful words uh, in a variety of languages. Words that say a whole lot with very few letters. Schadenfreude, for example, the German word which means to take pleasure in the misery uh, that someone else experiences. My personal favorite word is uh, defenestrate or defenestration, which means to throw someone or something out of a window. But I, I learned a new word uh, just the other day, I think most of you probably saw that Finland was admitted to the NATO alliance, but they, there was another story that said Finland was once again named the happiest country in the world. And so I was reading an article and I came across this word, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this correctly, but it's karkarikanet, which means getting drunk in your underwear with no intention of going out at all. I think we may have found the secret to the Finns' happiness. They've got this life thing figured out. All right, now another segue to Sofia Ruiz. Uh, Sofia's presentation is called Uncovering Her Story, Lauren Gunderson's Silent Sky. Sophia. I remember my first museum visit as a kid, walking along rows and rows of male statesmen thinking, where are all the girls? Later, flipping through my science textbooks, looking at one discovery by a man after another, my 10-year-old self insisted, some girls must have been interested. They must have been involved. When I started to do some digging, my hunch was proved right. We have always been involved in the making of history, often in the most unexpected ways, from women disguising themselves as male soldiers to scientists who would make discoveries that would change the face of science. Thanks to historians like Pamela D. Toller and playwrights like Lauren Gunderson, we have started to tell these stories, but they're still far from common knowledge. And that is where my research comes in. In the fall, I will be performing the role of Henrietta Swan Leavitt in the play Silent Sky. Henrietta was an astronomer born in 1868. And at first, she was relegated to the low paying and low ranking job of human computer, which was deemed suitable for feminine skills, such as attention to detail. But through her perseverance and intelligence, she came up with a measuring system that allowed people to calculate the distance between the Earth and any star. Now, as an actor, my research is in the embodiment and the exploration of other people's lives, real or fictional. To give you an example, that mask was created drawing from my heritage as a Mexican woman and stories of female warriors around the world. I used it to explore what it would have felt like to disguise myself as a soldier, what hiding my femininity might have done to my body and what it could have done to theirs. This research allowed me to delve into their lives and to create a performance with which to tell their story and its relevance today to an audience. With Henrietta, I will be doing much the same to delve into her psyche and her circumstances. I will explore what it might have done to her posture to pour over image after image of the silence of the sky. I will try to take a look at what obstacles she might have faced as a woman in STEM in her time, so that the next time a young girl goes to a museum or watches a movie about people in science, she won't be left wondering, where are all the girls? Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophia. Another fun word. Yeah, we're, we're going to stick with that theme for a minute. Ultra crepidarian. Anybody know what that word means? Oh, wow, I actually did discover something you didn't know. Okay, so as a noun, it means a person who expresses opinions on matters outside the scope of their knowledge or expertise. I have other words that I use for those people, but we don't need to repeat those now. Uh, any cat lovers in the audience? 
All right. Well, you'll, you'll probably like this one. This study actually won an Ig Nobel Prize. Are you familiar with the Ig Nobel Prizes? Okay, so if you're not, it's kind of the strange cousin to the Nobel. They're, they're uh, studies that sound a little silly, but, but ultimately make people think, and a lot of times they're actually very insightful. So the 2021 winner for biology, Studies of Cat-Human Communication. So they spent 10 years, 10 years, years studying different kinds of cat sounds. Purring, chirping, chattering, twilling, tweedling, murmuring, meowing, moaning, all that sort of stuff. And they tested humans to see how well they could evaluate what kind of call it was, what the cat was trying to say. And ultimately what they found, to no surprise to the cat owners in the world, is that yeah, the humans could understand exactly what they were saying. They could differentiate between a happy meow or a meow uh, that was uh, a cat yowling but because they have hunger pangs or whatever. So if you are a cat person, go ahead and accept this as a personal win, but maybe take it easy on how often you talk about your cat. Um, I say this as a cat owner, as a cat lover, there, there, there is a limit to how often people want to hear about how intuitive your cat is. Another perfect segue to our next competitor, Donovan Cantrell. Donovan's talk is called The Cellular Recycler. Donovan. Thank you. Hello, my name is Donovan Cantrell, and I'm a graduate student within the biochemistry department. We as humans are beginning to recognize the necessity of recycling. However, nature, they, know, they have known of its importance all along. Every living thing has built-in recycling mechanisms, whether that be utilizing decayed soil material, protein from that cheeseburger you ate last weekend, or even materials within our own bodies. All organisms metabolize by converting available materials, such as your morning protein shake, into useful materials, such as muscle. The cells that make up every living thing likewise function as incredibly efficient recycling plants. They convert sugars into energy, fats into cellular compartments, and proteins into cellular machines. These machines will on occasion break down, become defective, or take away room from other cellular components. When this happens, these machines must also be recycled. This is done by tagging them with the ubiquitin protein tag, labeling them for recycling. They are then broken down into their base components, and these components are used to assemble new functional protein machines. This tagging process is mediated by a series of complex protein machines called ubiquitin ligases. The regulation of these ubiquitin ligases is, however, poorly understood. My research focuses on how individual components within these complex ubiquitin ligase machines function to regulate the overall machine. This is done by purifying individual components and observing their behavior. We can observe the behavior of these components under certain circumstances, we can observe how they interact, and we can observe what factors influence these interactions. This information is useful for building a model for how these complexes function as a whole and designing experiments to test our model. A refined model is useful for designing treatments for diseases associated with cellular recycling. This has the potential to improve the conditions of those with developmental diseases, reduce the prevalence of aging-related diseases, such as Alzheimer's, and help treat and prevent many different types of cancers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Donovan. I hope you appreciate by this point how difficult this really is. Uh, a lot of what you're looking at here is many, many years in some cases of research, and it all has to be condensed down into three minutes. That is not an easy task, but I think you'll agree that our students are doing a fantastic job of just that. Now, uh, we already talked about Nintendo. That's enough of that. So when we talked about Nintendo, we also talked about playing cards. I love this fact. This, 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 this is something, you can, you can work this out at home if you have the time and inclination. Playing cards, 52 cards in a deck, right? 
If you were to calculate all the different variations that you could have in one deck of playing cards, the simple formula for that is 52 factorial, which is, in case you don't know, 52 times 51 times 50 times 49, all the way down to 1, which gives you just an astronomically huge number. It is 8, roughly, 8 times 10 to the 67th power. That's 8 with about 67 zeros after it. So essentially, if you have a deck of cards that's well mixed, obviously they come from the factory arranged in, in order, but if you have a deck of cards that's well mixed, chances are that the shuffle that you've just done has never existed before in the history of the world, and it'll probably never exist again. And there are more ways to arrange a deck of cards than there are atoms on Earth. Yeah, I know. Take a moment to let that sink in while you prepare yourself for our next presentation, which is from Savannah Greer Downing. Savannah is going to uh, talk to us about diffractive remembrance. Savannah, please. Memories are important, and how we remember matters. That's something that rhetorical scholars have said for a long time. Monuments, memorials, museums, these things we build, places that we go to visit to remember, tell us something about our values, what matters, what doesn't matter, what it means even to be who we are. But when it comes to analyzing memory practices like that in my field, oftentimes rhetorical critics are placed into a set of binary questions where they ask what is remembered and what is forgotten in this particular memory practice. And then necessarily that follows with what are the ethical implications of that remembering or that forgetting. But in my dissertation, I suggest that rhetorical critics can actually participate in ethical remembrance as ourselves through the practice of writing about memory practices. So as you can see on this slide, I named this methodology diffractive remembrance, and there's two parts. We'll start with the second word. You'll notice it's hyphenated. That signals the role of the rhetorical critic in suturing together a variety of memory practices together. That allows us, instead of criticizing one memory practice, to piece them together and anticipate any deficits or gaps that might exist. The second part is diffractive. That comes from my understanding of Karen Barad, feminist theoretical physicist, who tells us that unlike reflection, where something mirrors something else or looks like something else, diffraction is that moment where things work through one another and produce something anew. So together, this rhetorical methodology is a way for rhetorical critics to actually participate in ethical remembrances and do so by piecing together lots of memory practices and reading them through one another. In my case, I'm remembering the radium girls, and they can be remembered in a lot of ways. As workers who succumb to radium poisoning at the hands of their employer, as working class women who made a difference in their families and communities, and as a dark moment in US history of labor and environmental injustice. But however they are remembered, they should be. Because what they experienced led to safer radium exposures that all of us in here benefit from today, and better working conditions under OSHA. So in my case, I'm interested in understanding how they're remembered, but I'm using this methodology I've developed because I recognize that all memory practices, films, books, memory tours that I've taken part of are all important for maintaining and sustaining the memory of the radium girls. I think there's three key takeaways from using this methodology. Not only does it give us a more complex picture of what memory looks like in a particular phenomenon, but it also allows the rhetorical critic to participate, participate in the ethical remembrances that we desire. And finally, diffractive remembrance does justice to the reality that memories do not operate in isolation from one another. Rather, they work through one another together diffractively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Savannah. In much more mundane news, a whole orange will float in water, but it sinks if you peel it. Something, a little science experiment you're free to try out at home. There are apparently 177,147 different ways to tie a necktie. That's why I don't have one on, is I couldn't, I just couldn't pick one out of all of those options. Um, there are also more than 915 million ways to combine six standard Lego bricks. Anybody play with Legos as a kid? Well, you barely brush the surface, I guarantee you. Um, this was an interesting study, I thought. It said, taking a photo of something 
actually reduces your ability to remember it. I'm thinking particularly of people who record fireworks displays and, uh, and concerts, that kind of thing. It, it is, uh, the, the researchers described it as offloading your memory uh, and the photo taking impairment effect. So when people rely on technology to remember something for them, they're actually less likely to remember the event itself. So maybe just put the phone down for a minute and just watch and enjoy. And you can watch and enjoy our next speaker. God, that was a smooth segue. I'm, I'm proud of that one. Haley Joel Smith, who will talk about reimagining human waste as a natural resource, ethical and educational pathways to sustainable sanitation systems. Haley. The first time I used a toilet that transformed its contents into soil, I was intrigued. I began studying large-scale systems and building household ones like this one here. And innovative technologies prove it possible to regenerate our land and water via our toilet systems. So why don't we see more of these in the United States? How is it we continue to install systems that pollute our drinking water and habitat? What will it take to change our approach so that we adopt sustainable sanitation systems? One answer is education. We need to know how to teach about this taboo topic. My research at UGA has led to the development of effective methods for teaching about the social, environmental, and infrastructure aspects of wastewater and resource reclamation systems. Novel educational tools include 3D models and system diagrams that demonstrate how our household toilet systems are connected to the natural environment, food, water, and energy systems. Results show significant learning gains. We also found that the barrier of disgust is overcome by explaining the evolutionary and cultural reasons for adversity to human excrement and by pointing out the potential in our pee and poop. For example, each person produces enough nutrients to fertilize the amount of grain needed to make a loaf of bread per day. Students were asked what toilet system they would prefer in their home and to explain why. Results show that they have wonderful ideas and that there are four key values that influence their decision making. One, wise use of resources, water, nutrients, and money. Two, practical, it's gotta be easy to maintain. Three, avoids causing harm to people and the natural environment, and four, contributes to something good. Students identified toilet systems as a way to give back. These values were more important than maintaining the social norm of flush and forget. Instead, they would prefer to adopt toilet systems that capture and cultivate. They also said that more people needed to learn about sustainable sanitation options. In fact, 95% of students shared their new knowledge with family and friends. This demonstrates the impact of effective education. Now, I invite you to imagine a future where your toilet system utilizes human waste as a natural resource. Thank you. Thank you very much, Haley. I, I can't believe it, but we're getting close to the end of the competition. We only have two more competitors, but you are going to have to sit through just a few more facts for me, so uh, hold on, hold on. According to one researcher who shall remain nameless, but still I found this interesting, human beings are not the top of the food chain. Um, you've got plants that I, I think kind of rudely are down at the bottom of the food chain. Uh, they make their own food. And then I suppose you've got the, the uber predators, you know, your great white sharks and your orcas and your uh, polar bears, which you cannot see with uh, night vision goggles. Uh, you've got them up at the top. But the, this researcher actually placed uh, humans somewhere between pigs and anchovies on the food chain which I, I kind of like. Another researcher, uh, well, actually, this is the work of a group of researchers. There's a genus of fly called the Pisa 
genus, I'm probably saying this wrong, the Pisa genus. But there are different subspecies of this genus called Pisa cake, Pisa pie, Pizzeria, and Pisa destrians. You know, don't ever tell me that scientists don't have a sense of humor, because they absolutely do. They knew what they were doing. And now, another just butter smooth segue to Molly Stevens. Molly's presentation is titled Vintage 536. What happened to booze in humanity's worst year? Molly. Thank you. So, the worst year of human history wasn't 2020. It was probably 536 CE. Why? Well, somewhere a volcano erupted, spewing ash into the sky and blocking out the sun. We know it was a volcano because it left marks on the ice caps. That big spike you see there is sulfur gas and debris. The results? Up to a four degree centigrade drop worldwide in less than a year. We know this from tree rings. You can see the drop there. And so I, what happened? There were widespread famines, huge human migrations. But I hear cold, dark, and I think, what happened to the grapes? You see, I grew up in Napa, California. I grew up in the wine industry. And a lot of people back home, hi everyone, are worried about what climate change will do for the wine industry. So when I think about the place I study, Roman Palestine, which was kind of the Napa Valley of the Byzantine world, I want to know how they dealt with a climate disaster. So what happened to wine after 536? How do I find this? Well, I can go to written sources. Problem is 536 was a long time ago, so there are five. But of these five, almost every single one of them mentions a failure in wine or grapes that year. Okay, written sources are a little helpful. What about comparing it to another year where something similar happened? A great example, 1816, the so-called year without a summer. In this case, there was another volcanic eruption, Tambora in Indonesia, another big spike in volcanic detritus in the ice caps, and another big dip in temperature. Thankfully, 1816 has a lot more written documents that we can reference, including grape harvest dates. Why are grape harvest dates important for talking about climate? Well, grapes are very temperature sensitive. It has to be 10 degrees centigrade for them to come out of, of dormancy, and it has to have enough heat and light to ripen it all. No ripening, no wine. So after 1816, we find that harvest dates were pushed back by about a month if there was any harvest at all. The funny thing is, though, the industry didn't entirely collapse. This is weirder because the decades after 536, the 540s, was the coldest decade in history since the year one. How did this survive? Well, Roman farmers tended to plant more than one varietal of grape in their vineyards, some more heat tolerant, some more wet tolerant. This was insurance against usual climate variation during the seasons. But if, say, some of your vineyard happened to survive a climate collapse, you could propagate your vineyard again from the surviving vines. Perhaps people back home should do this too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Molly. So woodpeckers, bear with me here, woodpeckers have a third eyelid which stops their eyes from pop, popping out when they're hitting the, you, no, never mind. The smell of Play-Doh, everybody played with Play-Doh when they were kids, the smell is trademarked. They actually trademarked the smell of it. It's, you know, it's not that unusual. Uh, uh, scents, colors, sounds, the, the NBC chime, I think most people know what that sounds like. Those can all be trademarked, so long as companies or individuals can prove that consumers have strong associations with them. I guarantee you, scent is obviously very closely tied to memory. If someone popped open some Play-Doh right beneath your nose, you'd be taken back to, yeah, you know, we all know. We all played with it. Um, this is a fun little factoid for you. This comes to us from the Oxford English Dictionary. So this is a reasonably authoritative source. The word to run, the verb to run, 
is the single word with the most potential meanings in all of English. No fewer than 645 different usage cases for the verb form alone. Now, I sat down for a moment and I started to think about this. You can obviously run a marathon. You can run an errand. You can run a bath. A river runs. Uh, you can, uh, I don't know, there, there's a bunch of different ones. But I got to about 10 and I started to think, no, no, this can't be right. Sure enough, Oxford English Dictionary has every single one of them mapped out. The entry uh, in the written form covers pages. On a web page, you have to scroll forever. So, you know, if you're a curious person, go check it out. Some of them are a little bit archaic, but there are about 645 of them. And ladies and gentlemen, I am very sad to say that we are at our last presenter for the evening. But please welcome Michaela, Michaela Dykus whose presentation is called Saving Moolah, linking the gastrointestinal microbiome to feed efficiency in Angus cattle. Michaela. Who all feels like they are constantly going to the gas station to pump gas, yet not getting a lot of bang for your buck? Right, we all do. Well, for beef cattle producers, gas is just like animal feed. Animal feed is the highest input cost for beef cattle producers, and it is very defeating, just like with gas, when you feel like you're spending a lot of money on something, yet not getting a lot of gain in return. Therefore, the ultimate goal for beef cattle producers to become more economically efficient is to become more feed efficient. So think of feed efficiency like the miles per gallon in your car. When you're driving, your vehicle's efficiency fluctuates based on your vehicle weight, speed, terrain, etc. However, we really are unsure which inside or outside forces most predominantly affect the beef cattle's microbiome and its effect on feed efficiency the most. What we do know is that ruminant animals, such as cattle, have the unique ability to digest normally unpalatable and indigestible feedstuffs due to the microbial population inhabiting their rumen, the largest of the four chamber stomach system that ruminants have. Ruminant microbial fermentation has primarily two end products a readily form of energy known as volatile fatty acids and methane. Volatile fatty acids are absorbed through the rumen wall, but methane cannot, so it is energy lost to the animal. Just like how our cars that have better fuel efficiency produce less uh, greenhouse gases, our cattle that are better feed efficient produce less methane, a major greenhouse gas. So for us to understand what exactly is going on in the gastrointestinal tract microbial population, my colleagues and I traveled across the entire United States to cattle farms with feed efficiency testing equipment in order to capture the entire beef production system in the U.S., the largest undertaking of its kind. At each of these farms, each animal has individual feed intake data so that we can measure each animal's level of feed efficiency on an individual basis. We then collected rumen and fecal samples from each animal in order to capture the entire gastrointestinal tract. We took these samples back to the lab and are extracting their DNA and then sequencing their genetic code in order to figure out which microbial populations exist and in what proportions they exist in. We then can link these microbial populations to feed efficiency in our cattle. Therefore, the overall objective of my research is to strengthen our understanding regarding the link between the gastrointestinal microbiome and feed efficiency in Angus cattle and the largest cattle microbiome project to ever be conducted. With the completion of my research, we hope to identify strategies to increase feed efficiency, thereby decreasing input costs and increasing animal gain, just like how we all want to have better miles per gallon in our cars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michaela. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our last competitor for the evening, but uh, we have a little bit more work to do. Our judges are tallying up some of their final scores. We will actually put those all together here and make the announcement of our winners here this evening. So you have to bear with us for a little bit as we get some of those together. But please don't forget about the People's Choice Awards. That is on the back of your program, so you can access uh, the, the form with your uh, smartphone. Just scan the QR code on the back of the program, and that will take you to the place where you can vote. But 
uh, I would ask that every single one of you, now that they're all reassembled here, uh, would, would you all please stand one more time? Everybody, please recognize our graduates, our students one more time this evening. Thank you all so much for everything you've done. So if uh, this would be a perfect moment if you do need to run out, uh, just so you know there are some restrooms just right outside the front. Uh, if you need to, this would be a great moment to take a quick break, but we will not take long uh, to tabulate these scores. Uh, and when we do, we will present the winners this evening. I can, of course, I, I've still got a, a couple of more factoids if you'd like me to kill some time for you. All right, all right, uh, that's a resounding yes. So a lot of people ask uh, what kind of superpower you'd like to have. Some people say they'd like to fly. Some people say they'd like super speed. Some people would like the ability to move objects with their mind. Some people, though, choose invisibility. And I've got to be completely honest with you. I'm a little skeptical of people who choose invisibility in the first place because I've yet to think of an honest use for this superpower. Uh, but, you know, they may be out there. Nevertheless, I saw a study, well, not really a study, it was really more of a professional musing on invisibility. The problem with being invisible, invisible is that you'd also probably be completely blind. It took me a minute to wrap my head around this, but bear with me. If, if you're completely invisible, there's, there's really two kinds of invisibility, uh, even though it doesn't really exist. Uh, if light just passed straight through you, there was nothing at all to see, then presumably light is passing straight through your eyes as well. Rods and cones would have absolutely no opportunity to pick up on light because it's just passing right through, so you wouldn't see anything. Uh, or light could be bent around you and reassembled in some way to make it seem like you're invisible, but in that case too, everything is going around you. So if you had an invisibility cloak, kind of like what they had in Harry Potter, that sort of thing, it would be like shrouding yourself in complete darkness. So. I'm still very much in the camp that invisibility is one of the lamer superpowers. Uh, my sister and I actually talked about this not that long ago, and I think she has the best answer. She would choose sorcery, uh, because sorcery gets you access to all kinds of superpowers, right? You just need that one thing. You cast the right spell, you can do all those different things. I think ultimately that's the smart answer. This. Uh, this is probably my favorite thing of the night, and that's why I saved it for very last. A nine-year-old dog, a Labrador, named Tango, was called to the witness stand in a court in France. It was during a preliminary hearing to confirm the allegations against its owner's suspected killer. So they had... Uh, they had this person come in and pretend to threaten the dog to see if the dog would react negatively. Uh, but to keep the test fair, a second dog named Norman, who's the same age and breed as Tango, was brought in to serve as the control group. So I cannot think of a more scientifically rigorous test. I wish I had been in that courtroom that day. That is the stuff of dreams for people like me. I would write about that for hours. But I never found out if he was guilty or not. Or, uh, regardless, I think it's safe to... Do we have any attorneys in the office? Yes, I think we have a few. I, I don't know if your case is super duper strong if you're relying on the testimony of a Labrador retriever. Um, that is decidedly unfortunate. But Again, we will be back with you in just a moment. We're just tabulating a few scores, so talk amongst yourselves. We'll be right back with you, okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to announce that we are ready to announce our winners. Very kind to join us this evening. We have Provost of the University of Georgia, Jack Hu. We have Vice Provost for Graduate Education and Dean of the Graduate School, Ron Walcott. They are going to join us up here on stage to announce our winners. Gentlemen, please.
So good night, everyone, and thank you so much for being here. Before we, we announce every, all the winners, I want to uh, remind you that this is uh, Graduate and Professional Student Appreciation Week, and we want to take this opportunity to show appreciation for all the efforts and contributions of our graduate students. So join me in a round of applause to all of our graduate students. Secondly, I want to say, of course, I want to say congratulations to not only the finalists, but all of the competitors who were involved in 3MT, but especially the 10 of you. You were amazing. I mean, every time I see students perform in the 3MT, I always go, I could never do that, right? So that requires a lot of poise, preparation, concentration, and you guys should all be commended. So with no further ado, let's go ahead and announce We'll start with the People's Choice Award. It's a pregnant pause. Right? <laughs> so you on your edges of your seats waiting for me to tell you who won, right? And so the People's Choice winner is Yang Su. I decided to dispense with the pregnant pauses. So the runner up is Chisholm Okoli. And the moment we've all been waiting for is the grand prize winner for 2020-23, Karen Gonzalez. At this time, I'd like to ask all of the, the 10 finalists to join us on stage for a picture, if you would will, and um, I think we'll commemorate this moment. And, and now I'll give Provost Hu a moment to say a few words uh, to, to the audience. So first I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, in particular, I want to thank the judges. I told the dean that there are the three busiest people that I know of, so thank you for spending time with us. Of course, I want to congratulate the three winners and hope the first prize winner will represent the university well in the national competition. Of course, everyone, congratulations for getting this far. Of course, I want to thank all the mentors for working with your students. 
I would say the faculty enable everyone, enable our students to do the best work. And students are the stars tonight, but the faculty are the ones behind the stars this evening. So thanks for everyone for being here. And finally, before allowing you to depart for the day, I want to thank the staff of the Graduate School who've worked tremendously behind the scenes to make this a very successful event. I want to thank Meredith Welch Devine for all the effort that she put into it. Um, Meredith. As well as the other uh, Graduate School staff who've been flitting around, making everything work, um, work really well. So once again, thank you for coming out tonight to support our students, and have a wonderful evening.